So in this session we have th uh, three lectures. The first lecture will be delivered by Professor Nicholas Walker. From uh, now he is in the Newcastle University, but it's here it is written the Bristol University. Is the same? On <laughs> okay. So that's the topic of his lecture. Okay. So uh, thank you for the invitation to present here. This is my first time in India. I'm from Newcastle University, and I was, I should say that's Newcastle University in the United Kingdom, not Newcastle University in Australia. In Australia. And it's not the biggest city in the UK, so I wanted to find something to say to you about why you might think about or why you might remember Newcastle, what's notable about it. So this is where it is. First of all, it's, it's in the northeast, the closest big English city to Scotland. And it's surrounded by these hills. And these hills, 200 years ago, were full of, full of coal reserves. So this is one of the places that, that fueled the Industrial Revolution. About 200 years ago, again, the country, Britain, was running out of wood. No wood left to heat people's homes. So people started to dig deeper for coal. And what happens when you dig deeper in a coal mine is the mine starts to flood. It fills up with water. So these kinds of machines, these big water pumps, started to fill the mines around Newcastle and Durham in this, this area, of the, uh, area of England. Because it's very hilly, the other thing that used to, we used to have in the northeast were these wagonways. Because if you've got a big cart of coal like this and you want to move it by cart, then you get a lot further if you put some rails down and move it over the rails than if you actually try to push it over the stones and over the grass and everything else. So we had these pumps and we had these wagonways uh, ringing these hills around Newcastle. Now, of course, it wasn't a big stretch of the imagination for people to think, well, if we put engines like this on carts that were on our wagons, then maybe they could move without the benefit of the horse. So here I'm talking about locomotion the idea that something would move itself using an engine. So uh, this started to happen for moving these, this coal around on these wagonways. We had some crude engines that were designed to do that. And of course, people started to ask questions about whether we could do with this with passengers. And this person, Robert Stevenson, set up a workshop in Newcastle to build these. And finally, when the case looked strong enough, the government decided maybe we should invest. We'll put a, a lot of money into a railway between Liverpool and Manchester. And that's all very well, but they thought, well, we need the right engine to go on it. So then they needed a competition to sort out who was going to do that. Robert Stevenson entered that competition with his train, which was called the Rocket, and it left the competition in the dust. So there were three engines um, at the Rainhill trials here. One of them failed on the start line, couldn't get it started at all. The next one, went for about half an hour and then it broke. But the rocket kept going all day, pulled a ton of load at about 25 miles an hour for five or six hours. So that was the choice. And the rest is history. And this is a picture of the rocket in its modern age, and this is me in front of it. So I was delighted when it came back to Newcastle. This is a museum at Newcastle. This is what it looks like now. So if you want a reason to remember Newcastle, that would be it, right? The beginning of passenger locomotion. Nothing I say today will be as impressive as this, but unlike Robert Stevenson, I have worked on the hydrogen bond. So, let's move on. The two, um, the two molecules that I'm going to speak most about today, imidazole, we've seen a lot of already over the last two days. Imidazole is an important building block in, in biomolecules such as this. It's a component part of histidine, it's a component part of cytosine. It's also important in ionic, ionic liquids, the other one I'll mention right towards the end is urea. Urea is important for similar reasons. Again, it's a biomimetic, but also Wohler's synthesis in 1828. It was a big landmark in organic chemistry, the, the production of this molecule in the first place. Solid state isomorphs, archetypal of hydrogen bonding. What that means is that if you're a crystallographer, if you're a solid state chemist, you look at all the different isomorphs, I'm talking thousands here, and you use them to study cooperative, bonding, cooperative hydrogen bonding in, in solids. Like water, it forms vast networks of hydrogen bonds in lots of different arrangements, and for that reason it's interesting in that way. If you're a biochemist, 
then it's used to denature proteins. So if you have a solution of urea and water, and you add that, to, or you add your protein to that, you might be able to controllably unfold or refold your, your protein. So in terms of doing biochemistry in the laboratory in a, what's called an in vitro sample, urea is a really useful tool here. So let's start with imidazole, but before we start with imidazole, something about the experiment. I'm an experimental scientist and I do microwave spectroscopy. And this is a, a picture of my spectrometer in the lab. It's a chirped pulse Fourier transform microwave spectrometer. So in Fourier transform microwave spectroscopy, shares many similarities with NMR. We have an excitation or a polarization pulse. Then we switch that off. Then we detect the free induction decay. We Fourier transform that and then we have our spectrum. In microwave spectrometers for much of the last 30 years, it's been possible to look at one megahertz of bandwidth within a range spanning from about 6 to 18 gigahertz. In a chirp pulse FTMW instrument, you can look at the entire range in a single measurement. The reason for that is fast digital electronics. So we take a pulse from a 24 giga sample per second AWG. That pulse sweeps from 0 to 12 gigahertz in about a microsecond. We mix it with 19 gigahertz, just a steady signal, because if you mix like this, so if you have 12 to 0.5 and you subtract that from 19, you get a pulse that's 7 to 18.5 gigahertz. And, and this is the region of the spectrum in which we want to study our chemistry. That's where, for us, the interesting things happen. We then have to amplify that pulse using a very powerful microwave source, so a 300 watt traveling wave tube amplifier, so that we have enough power to polarize molecules across the range we're working in. And then it's transmitted um, through the chamber where we, uh, where we irradiate our sample. In terms of the sample preparation, we take a compressed gas, and the compressed gas will contain a small amount of precursor, and we'll do a, a supersonic expansion here. So we'll pressure, the pressurized gas is allowed to, is pulsed into a vacuum. And in that vacuum, our molecules become very rotationally cold. So we've got a supersonic expansion in this space here. So that encounters the polarization pulse. When the polarization pulse is switched off, we have the free induction decay passed through here. And then we'll mix it down against the 19 gigahertz to give us 0 to 12 again. That just makes this, that, that, that makes it possible to digitize the signal at this 25 gigahertz oscilloscope. So what we have in the end is a sp spectrum that runs from 6.5 to 18 gigahertz. And for every nozzle pulse, we can measure that entire range. Uh, one of the specializations that my group has is to study molecules that are not volatile in the gas phase. And we use laser vaporization to do that. All the experiments I'll talk about today were made possible by laser vaporization. This is a photograph of the block we use. So imagine, imagine the supersonic expansion coming towards you. right? The, the tube is coming in from behind the screen here, and the expansion is, is coming out towards you. The laser comes in from the right-hand side, impacts on a spot on the rod here. And you can kind of see the shape of the plume, because it's, it's created a charred area on the block there. So the, the, the plume from this solid material is, is interacting with this supersonically expanding pulse. And somewhere in that supersonic expansion, we make the molecules that we're, we're interested in. So this rod here consists of about um, 10 to 15, I think it's 50% amidazole with 50% copper, copper powder. The only purpose the copper powder has is we find that we get better signals if we use that as a matrix than if we use a pure material. So that's why it's got that copper color. And what you'll see is that there's a kind of pockmarked trail here. We ro continuously rotate and translate the rod so that every laser pulse hits a fresh surface of material. And that's why you can see, see this track on the rod. This kind of track would have been generated probably over about three or four hours of running. OK, so what do we achieve through this? 
in the end, through microwave spectroscopy, most of the information you get comes from three numbers, the rotational constant. And the key thing about the rotational constants is that they are inversely proportional to the moment of inertia about the three axes of the molecule. So if you have a diatomic, then you get a very accurate bond length. It's very straightforward. If you have a relatively small molecule like this and you do isotopic substitution, you can get very accurate structures, very accurate um, bond lengths in every internal coordinate. As molecules get bigger and bigger, you find you're getting more and more limited information about all the different structural parameters that exist in that, that molecule. OK, so now let's go for some data. I won't show you too many, too much data and too much analysis during this talk, because I think you're probably more interested in the hydrogen bonding phenomena itself. But um, I, I always like to give you a flavor of what, we, of what we look at in the lab. So this is what we uh, would obtain with a experiment much like the one I just described. We're vaporizing a midazole from a copper matrix. Over two hours of real time, we see a spectrum like this. Most intense signal, as you might expect, is the amidazole monomer. We see a bunch of other things too. HCCCN, um, acetonitrile here. But if you look down in the noise, that's very often where we find our most interesting information. So if you were to do that with this spectrum, what you find is a regular pattern of transitions separated by a regular interval. That's really useful if you're a spectroscopist because that points to uh, that, that points to the possibility you might have a spectrum you can interpret. In this case, it's the spectrum of a near prolate symmetric rotor. Now, when we started this experiment, we were looking for a midazole attached to a copper chloride molecule. That's why we had copper and a midazole in the rod in the first place um, in that particular experiment. But when we did this experiment, that isn't what my student found. Student came back and said, I found something else. He said, I found the spectrum of the imidazole dimer. So two imidazole units attached together. That's how we kind of got started on this route, and that's also how we discovered copper was a good matrix for these materials. So the imidazole dimer, what you see here is the k equals 1 lines are the outlying ones, and in the center you've got k equals 0, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's very near prolate, this molecule. So we wrote this up in uh, 2016, Having done quite a lot of isotopic work on it, um, we deuterated the, uh, the imidazole in order, and both around here and then at this key hydrogen bonding site. And what we discovered is that this is the lowest energy geometry. This is what we get. This, this is the structure of the molecule that is the carrier for the spectrum we see. Now, one reason this is intense in our spectrum is this has a dipole moment of 9 Debye. This is really big. Our method is more sensitive to things that have big dipole moments. As it happens, this wasn't the first observation of this molecule. So Choi and Miller saw this in 2009 in uh, amidazole embedded in helium droplets. They noticed this big dipole moment as well. So let's look at similar molecules. So maybe I'll go, go back. The, a key thing about amidazole is it's got a, a site here where you've got a nitrogen with a lone pair that looks like pyridine. We call that the pyridinic nitrogen. You also have a site here where you've got a nitrogen hydrogen. That part of the molecule looks like pyrrole. We call it the pyrrolic nitrogen. Imidazole has both a pyridinic site and a pyrrolic site. It's inherently bifunctional. So let's look at those similar molecules, pyridine and pyrrole, and see what people see in terms of hydrogen bonding. Some of my punchlines here were taken by Sanjay yesterday, so um, he's all, you've already heard a lot of this story. So if you look at the complex formed between pyridine and ammonia, what you find is that you have a hydrogen bond here between the pyridinic nitrogen, but then a secondary interaction between the CH and the N. This was published by Putsarini, Caminati and co-workers in 2017. It's a very dynamical problem. The ammonia was rotating, and they measured the barrier to rotation of that. So secondary interaction, primary hydrogen bonding interaction there. This is pyrrole, indole to ammonia, bond length of 2.15 angstroms, published in 2012, the group of Pratt. This would have been rotationally resolved electronic spectroscopy. And 
this, they, they invoked that this bond is shorter than it would have been if the dipole moments of the, this pyrrole part of the molecule and the ammonia weren't lined up. So there's an enhancement, the strength of that bond because of alignment of dipole moment. Other similar molecules. Pyridine water. So I should emphasize that although this is an experimental group, these structural parameters are computed parameters at the MO6, or it's a DFT calculation, but they computed both this primary bond, a nonlinear hydrogen bond here, and a secondary interaction to this CH. And what caught our eye when we started thinking about this was that there has been an, inf oops, there has been an infrared study of imidazole water before, done by the group of Martin Soom, and that was supersonic jet FTIR. So I should say that this picture was lifted direct from their paper. They didn't really talk about structure. So they, I don't think they gave any thought to the possibility of a CH interaction. But our experiment will explore that. Um, but what they did say was that they only saw this isomer. They did not see the isomer where you have water attached to the pyrrolic site. So what we wanted to explore was when you have the first water attached to a midazole, <laughs> Do you get a cooperative pair of hydrogen bonds, much like what you do in pyridine? So do, do you get something stick here and form a secondary interaction as well as a primary interaction? And we're interested not only in looking at that am amidazole, but also in methyl amidazole isomers. Because if you've got this part of the molecule here, perhaps it's rotating, how does that affect what's going on at this primary pyridinic site? In fact, we were surprised by what we found, because we identified from our spectra not only are this species here where we have water attached to the pyridinic site but we also identified a spectrum where you have water attached to the pyrrolic site so the roles have reversed right the, um, the role of water as a proton donor and amidazole as a protein acceptor is reversed when you come to this isomer we are confident because for each of these we measured HOD and water 18 isotopologues. That's important when you do microwave spectroscopy. Now what you're looking at here is our DFT calculated structure at this level. Now when we perform a fit to the structure to the experimental data, what we find is that we've got R naught, so we've got an R naught parameters here. So this bond length is about 2.13 angstroms and the bond between this oxygen and this hydrogen is only 2.87. Now you can probably see from looking that the scale of this diagram doesn't kind of show that at all. So um, the DFT is not picking up this interaction. I should say that I've been working on this a lot over the last week. This is work in progress. I need to work at it some more. But what I can say so far is that the DFT and all of our experimental data is consistent with a nonlinear hydrogen bond here. Right? So everything we're looking at tells us it's a nonlinear hydrogen bond. That tells us there must, must be a CH, pi, uh, a CH oxygen interaction. What I can't be clear about yet is the size of this angle. So just how bent around that water is to form that CH angle. Even this, this fit, I think, is the data is underfitted. So if you look at the axes here, the oxygen and the hydrogen are right on the A-axis, so we're not very sensitive to those structural parameters. So that needs more work. On this, in terms of the other isomer, so although we get good R0 parameters here, 2.01 angstroms is the length of this bond, and we've got an angle here of 152 degrees. That's the angle between the plane of the water and uh, the NH bond here we actually see two different states for that isomer. Right? Two different tunneling states, which are labeled 0 minus and 0 plus here. That's a signature in microwave spectroscopy of large amplitude motion. So it's unfortunately a slightly more complicated problem than it would be if it were a rigid rotor. We've used our DFT calculations to scan over some of the coordinates that are involved. In terms of the internal rotating motion, so if you're looking along the plane here, the barrier to that motion is about 140 reciprocal centimeters. But in terms of the water wagging motion, so here you've got one hydrogen above the plane of the imidazole ring and one below. And what you're looking at is the wagging backwards and forwards between these 
the transparent atoms at the extreme. That is a very flat surface indeed. So that can happen extremely easily. So there's two different coordinates can contribute to the, uh, the, the tunneling motion that we're seeing evidence for in our spectrum. Nevertheless, we can be confident about our, our fitted parameters here, what the lowest energy geometry is, um, because that wag and the internal rotor don't much affect where the oxygen atom or where the plane of the hydrogen atoms are. OK, so um, are this, how long have I got left? Three minutes. All right, I might um, whiz through some stuff. So we're also looking at methyl amidazole. I explained we're interested in where and how water coordinates to this. And this is all in progress, so none of this we've actually um, finished. Well, none of the work on complexes we've actually finished yet. We have finished studying what the barrier to rotation of the methyl rotor looks like. What you find is that there's a big difference between the barriers to rotation when you don't have a symmetric aromatic ring. So at the two site, only 123 wave numbers over here, about 350. That's true whether you're talking about imidazole, isoxazole, um, pyrrole, any of these molecules. OK, urea. So urea, as I've said, makes these interesting crystal structures. We started out looking for a urea dimer because that, you, you see the motif like that in the solid state structure of urea. We thought maybe it's like a midazole, maybe it'll be really intense in our spectra. We were wrong. So we did uncover a regular, again, a regular spectrum space by B, B plus C that was very interesting we wanted to identify. But it turned out not to be the urea dimer at all. It turned out to be a complex between urea and isocyanic acid. Got this really tight network of cooperative hydrogen bonds here, where you have a hydrogen interacting with this nitrogen, and then you have a hydrogen interacting with this oxygen, and we have these two uh, measurements. This has a really big dipole moment, which is one reason we saw it in our experiment. Why didn't we see the dime of urea? Well, despite the recurrence of that motif in the solid state, the, the head-to-tail orientation in the solid state, we think in the gas phase, probably the lowest energy geometry of that dimer looks like this. It's got no dipole moment. So to microwave spectroscopy, we're blind to it, which is unfortunate to us. But maybe if we can substitute um, one of these groups for something else, we can uh, study something that's a bit like the urea dimer. So what else are we working on? We have data for this thing, a complex of urea and amidazole. And we think it looks like this. This is what the, the confirmation, computed confirmation that best matches our experimental data. We don't have a definitive picture, so we haven't written it up yet. It's proven quite hard. We have data for urea argon, thiourea argon. That's quite definitive. We, we need to write that up. Urea water was studied uh, by the group of Therese Hue, Hue, Hue um, 2005. They haven't followed it with a paper yet. We have some data for this, but again, we think that's quite difficult. Some of the spectroscopy looks quite hard, and so that's still work in progress. So we're looking at these kinds of molecules where we have nitrogen-containing units with water and with other nitrogen-containing units and, and seeing what we can learn about cooperative hydrogen bonding. Um, that's it. Funding for most of the research I've talking about, spoken about was the European Research Council. These are the people who did the work. But funding for my trip here is provided by SPARC, the Scheme for Promotion of Academic and Research Collaboration, the Government of India. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. So the talk is open for discussion. Any question? Harish? Sanjay? Ben Benzimidazole dimers, we can talk about. Okay, I'll be interested. You can also ask questions about the trains if you, if you want. So, for this imidazole water complex, you, yeah. it appears that you have two different isomers, right? Yes. Uh, and both generated in, in an argon expansion. Uh. Um, where are they? Uh, too many slides. There. Yes. So, uh, Usually, as Sanjay was saying, usually in an argon expansion, you find your way to the lowest energy conformer. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes if you have things of similar energy, you have more than one. Right. Um, so you get this this abundance almost equal, or so we can't we can't say anything about abundance. What we can say is about intensity. Uh -huh. In terms of the intensity of our transitions, this one is slightly more intense. Um, so the the one that, that Martin Seem observed first that is slightly mm -hmm. more intense, mm -hmm. um, but intensity doesn't correlate exactly with abundances in our experiment. Right. And second thing is that in the next slide. That you have this tunneling splitting. This yeah. is this is much larger for this isomer. It looks like, right? Uh, th sorry, this is the same isomer. This is both. Oh, okay. Both of those are this one on the right. Mm -hmm. But in this case, this is H two O. In this case, this is what happens when you have a single mm -hmm. deuterium. Okay. So it slightly changes the the vibrational energy of the deuterium changes. So you get a change in the split. So in this two. I summers the dipole moments are comparable or are they very different? Did you they're, quite it? they're quite similar. Very similar. No? Yeah, I, I can't remember what the numbers yeah. are. I think it's six and five or something like that. They're pretty comparable, okay. We, but we do, because we have a splitting in this one, mm -hmm. of course, relative to this one, the intensities of the one that's split mm -hmm. are all brought down. Okay, okay. Yes. Nick, I have two questions. First one is why your insistence of using DFT because MP2 would have probably found that additional interaction. Ah, uh, this is work in progress. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Sanjay? I think even if you use DFT, take the mic. Even if you use, we have done this a lot of calculations including MP2, CP, MP2, uh, which were very high basis set, but you never get that CH by interaction, CHO interaction. This is really useful information to me because I'm trying to figure out and, what I'm going to put in the paper. And also so. the conclusive evidence, you might find it tilted this way as well as that way, but we don't see any enhancement in the CHIR transition. Right. So that is the conclusive evidence that there is no, you might find that it is closer, and using distance constraint, one may say that this is hydrogen bonded, but it is not really hydrogen bonded. Uh, one, one thing that, that, that does seem very clear from what we've had is that, that this oxygen points towards the C2. So it doesn't, it, it's more interested in, in bending towards the C2 than the C4, C5. That's very clear. But the second question is, what is the source of HNCO that you had in the other complex? Uh, so you can call it lucky or you can call it unlucky. But w when we do a laser vaporization experiment, not only do we vaporize the monomer, it's I intact. It's very destructive. So we almost atomize the, the, what we're vaporizing, and then it reforms into other things. And isocyanic acid was generated through the fragmentation of urea. I mean, that would also be, if, if can you look for the dimer of HNCO? That would be very interesting. Then. Um, it uh, may be, but it, it might also be so light that it's outside our range. I'd have to look at the structure that it had. Certainly, our group, the way we work, we're under instructions. We, our philosophy is that no matter what you're told that we're looking for, you study the baseline and you see what else is there, and then you follow every lead down. And, and that's actually why I'm in India, right? Because uh, 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 something we found in our spectra turned out to be useful to Aaron, and he followed it up. So w we try and follow every lead, but it, it can be difficult because there are plenty of lines, and sometimes we just can't assign them. Okay, so yes. Uh, this is not directly related to your talk, but it's for my general information. You have CH pi, OH pi, NH pi, all sorts of interaction. Now, if you have a heterocyclic ring and something is coming up, does it have preference to be on top of nitrogen or it could be at the centroid or anywhere? Um, I can only talk about what I've measured. Um, so, and the amidazole, the amidazole dimer shows a very clear preference to be, to be bound here rather than on the ring. Of course, if it's benzene, it's different because there isn't that you don't have that pyridinic site there. I don't, I, that may not answer the question, actually. Okay, so if there is no other question, then let us thank Nicola. Okay, no, no, one more question. Yes. <laughs> uh, 
So, uh, you, you mentioned that your nonlinear, uh, you, you emphasize your hydrogen bond is nonlinear in the yes. two, two yeah. sides of it. And the, is it expect, something expected, but is it more than, uh, you don't have any uh, explanation yet, or uh, what the important thing? So, I, so I explain that I'm, I'm confident that this bond here is nonlinear, and I can't say exactly how much. So the rationalization for that would be a secondary interaction between the, po the oxygen here and a positive region in here. Um, and, and this is something that other people have also seen in similar molecules. Uh, I'm seeing it, but I, I haven't quantified it. I'm not quantified. Yeah. So let's thank Nicholas once again.